Good morning, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. I'm just popping in a minute early, hoping that everything is working and all signals are good. I see Miss Elizabeth just popped in. Hey, from St. Louis. I was there for 12 years. Wonderful. Thank you so much. UK. Woohoo. And Rebecca, it's great to see you from Coeur d'Alene. You guys, I may cough a little bit. I've had a little bit of respiratory issues the last few days. Nothing significant. I took a COVID test, so I'm all good. Good morning, Linda. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. And Milo, from the UK, 4 p.m., indeed it is. I can't wait to get back to the UK. There's not been any uh, international travel in my world since uh, COVID started. And actually, I should say maybe even a year before that. We had a tour planned. A lot of you are popping in. It's great to see you. Thank you. We're going to be discussing the portal quilt that's behind behind me. I should go that way. Behind me today. And um, and just getting you guys started. Many of you uh, already have the kits and the patterns and so forth. Uh, but I, uh, I'll i get some more information on that. I'm just trying to let you guys pop in for this morning. I was thinking about uh, when you said uh, inter UK and international travel, um, Hugo uh, has been now here since uh, November the 8th of 2022, no, 2021, and um, he's from Portugal, and so he's been here, uh, and we've been working on getting his green card, and we have to say yay, uh, He's got his green card. So took 15 months, but we did the interview last Monday, no, last Tuesday. And um, and then we were notified on Cinco de Mayo that it was all approved and accepted. So now he can travel outside the U.S. So both of us will try to be making a trip uh, over to Portugal sometime before the end of the year. So he's not seen his family since arriving. So that will be great. All right, you guys, so a um, couple things. I couldn't sleep last night. I was so excited about uh, what I want to share with you today and thinking about all the best ways to do that. So that was one thing, all right? The other thing that's been on my mind has been um, our gardening here on the mountain. So I'm going to pop over into uh, my presentation for you today. And uh, if you have questions, I'm going to have to say, um, I won't be able to see the questions, I don't believe, when I'm over in presentation mode. Um, this is the first time I've done it like this, so if you have a question and I can't answer it right, right away, I will scroll back through the comments and do the best I can to answer questions for you. But we are going to be doing the portal quilt, and I'll share that with you. But first, I've got a couple of other little things I want to share with you, and that is... Um, that we have been gardening here on the mountain, all right? So um, this is Hugo. Uh, we decided that we wanted to do some uh, raised beds, primarily for tomatoes and perhaps peppers and or beans, just things like vegetables. And trying to do that at 9,000 feet is almost impossible. We're actually at um, 8780. So it's not quite 9,000, but that's still way up there, right? And of course, we have cold winters and we have wind like crazy. So trying to beat that battle is always crazy. But we had to level off a spot to do the beds. And Hugo would like for you to believe that he's the one that did all the leveling. But truth is, um, I did with the skid steer. That's me driving the skid steer. Um, the skid steer has been probably the best tool I've had on the mountain since moving here uh, so many years ago. I guess it was 2018 that I actually moved in. The house was built in 2016, 2017, early 2018. And so uh, this has been a good tool for me to remove snow and to move rocks and move dirt. And so um, for those of you that think I'm only a quilter or only an artist, here I am uh, doing my... Uh, my skid steer for you but we also took a little hike because if you look in the background you can see that the green has not arrived um, of course this is burned um, the fire came in 2018 as well three months after I moved in the house you can see that the fire really got close to the house if all these trees are the only ones that survived all of these trees just to the left of the skid steer burned so and even in the back over there so 
Anyway, all that's to say is that the underbrush and the oaks will come up and it will be green. But while it's not green, we get to go Easter egg hunting. And what I mean by that is we get to go look for the baby trees. And many of you uh, contributed to the baby trees. So I wanted to share with you how they're doing. Um, oh, this is our planter boxes that we finished on Saturday. Sorry, we did get that far, so now I have to order a bunch of soil to come in. But here's one of the trees that we planted in 2019. Now, this tree, when we planted it, it was not a bottle brush seed. This particular one was probably about a third of the size that it is now. It looked like a tiny little itty-bitty Christmas tree because it already had some branches coming out to the right. The ones that are just bottle brushes are still even smaller than this, but because they're green, we can find them while we're out and about. So I just wanted to share a little personal stuff with you guys as we're all coming in, and now I want to get right on into the, the class for you. So we're going to be doing portal today, and this quilt portal is one of my newest quilts. I designed and made this quilt pattern with quilters in mind, Oftentimes when I'm making may, maybe a competitive quilt, I am not thinking, how am I going to turn this into a pattern? I don't intend for it to be a pattern. Sometimes they're so complex that if I did spend, you know, however many thousand dollars to make the pattern happen, then I'm ended up with, you know, 10 people that would really buy that pattern because the quilt is too complicated. So when, <coughs> when designers often, like me, want you, uh, kind of the rubber hits the road quilter, you want to get it done, you're looking for something beautiful, impactful, this is what we try to come up with. And this was an idea I came up with basically from using jelly rolls. Now, I don't have jelly rolls and I don't use them, but I know that quilters love them and buy them. So I was wanting to just find a fun project that I could create that could be based on jelly rolls. Now, um, this particular uh, pattern, we're going to do, we're going to be doing this together over the course of the next few weeks. Today, of course, is session one. We're just going to get started to give you an overview and what you would need to do before Friday. And Friday, I will be back to visit with you and kind of give you some tips and tricks on what to do on the next part. And then the following Monday, a week from today, I'll be back visiting with you again to get kind of more close to the end. And then I'm not going to be working on this with you for a while because I want you to sew and get your quilt. So you need time to sew. So our final meeting will be on Monday, June the 5th, and we will figure out a way to get you to submit your images of your quilt, hopefully at least your quilt tops, um, so that we can share all the different variations. I'm going to share with you this morning that what you're seeing on the screen with my variation, my version, is not necessarily what you will make, unless that's what you choose to make. I'm going to give you the flexibility and many options to do several different things. So what are jelly rolls? First of all, they're pre-cuts. Um, they're two and a half inches wide, and it's by the width of the fabric, which is generally about 42 inches. It could be a little bit more or a little bit less. And then those are a bunch of different fabrics that are rolled. These strips are rolled, and you end up with a, a lovely bundle. And so for the portal project, we had to kind of specifically make some jelly rolls. We went out and uh, wonderful Kristen just spent some time looking at a bunch of batiks uh, with a company that we could get to make these jelly rolls and also some outstandingly beautiful ombres. And those, in case you don't know what an ombre is, um, an ombre is a fabric that changes color. So we have these kits they're $109. It includes the fabric plus the pattern. That is a steal of a deal for a quilt top. And then includes also the black fabric that goes around the edges. I, no, I don't think it does. I think it's just the jelly rolls because you get to border it the way that you want. But there are two kit versions at the quiltshop.com slash shop and batiks and ombre. I don't think there's many batiks left, but there are uh, plenty of ombres left. And if you just look at these beautiful uh, ombres, I think you will love them. Now, if you're going to be using your own fabrics, which is, I celebrate it, I want you to use a, be a stash buster, it'll be fabulous, then you only need the pattern, you can print it, uh, sorry, you can buy the printed version, or you can get the instant download and print it yourself. So you could, literally, if you just 
ch- chimed in and go, I want to do this, you could go to the quiltshow.com uh, slash shop and you can go to the kits and you can find Portal and you can find the instant download for that if you want to get that today. I mean, without even having to do shipping or anything. So that's always a bonus. But ombres. Ombres have a characteristic <coughs> and I can see the advantage in this because of the way they move from lights to darks and you're going to be working on a design wall, you're going to get to move these fabrics around. So the ombre kit probably gives more version options, more subtle changes than the batiks. The batiks, we all love batiks, I do too. They're going to probably look a little bit more like perhaps my quilt, and yet, honestly, I don't know. We're, we have picked the best fabrics that we can to make this happen. I also, as a full disclaimer, because I'm making this quilt just up, I got to make the quilt, I'm going to my fabric stash, which is primarily hand-dyed. So the, fa- the fabric and the quilt you see behind me are my hand-dyed fabrics. And in all fairness, I do need to tell you that we're not dyeing fabric right now. It's, it was a major part of the Ricky Tim's business for years and years, but because of COVID and losing my dyer and not being able to get the supply of fabric, that whole thing kind of went south. And I hope that someday, maybe, I will be able to revitalize that. But for now, I don't have hand-dyed fabrics to offer. So we then went to bat for you to try to find you the best replacement fabrics possible to do that. So I hope that makes sense. We have plenty of ombres left and a few batiks left. So here is just my quilt uh, in process on the wall, and we're going to talk about the design wall a little bit. I don't know if you have one or if you don't, but I can tell you that this project is going to be a lot easier, more friendly, maybe even more fun for you if you will work on a design wall. There's a million ways to do a design wall. You can use the back of a vinyl tablecloth that has flannel. You can buy flannel. You can buy batting. You can put it on the back side of a door. And I know that may not be a full-size uh, design wall, but anything you can do to be able to push the colors around because that's ultimately what will happen And it's not a matter of I made this block and then I made 15 of these blocks and I know if I just sew them together in rows and columns, it's going to work. So I urge you strongly uh, to work on a design wall and in the event that you don't have a large space, you could perhaps work in quadrants. You could do an upper left, an upper right, a bottom left, and a bottom right of your quilt and kind of work that way by taking some photos with your phone to kind of see how they're working together. So I'm just, I think that's an important thing. I don't want to leave that out. Um, something that I think you all, you all would appreciate knowing. Now, this particular quilt is going to be what we consider a one shape quilt. Uh, the trip around the world is a quilt that's made from nothing but squares. Squares, squares, no triangles, no rectangles, it's just squares, and that's a one shape quilt. Many of you would be familiar with the apple core. And the apple core is that kind of tapered uh, with convex and concave uh, units, and they nest together. So that would be a one shape quilt. The tumbler shape is another shape that we've seen in quilts very frequently, especially in some of the older quilts. So I kind of didn't realize at the time that I was going to create a one shape quilt, but I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to manage this project with, um, with, I'm trying to say the word and it's not coming, jelly roll strips. There we go. I wanted to use jelly roll strips. And so I knew that a jelly roll strip was approximately 42 inches. I also wanted to maximize the fabric without much waste. Um, as a quilter's I mean, if you're my granny, you didn't want any waste at all, right? I mean, it's like, are you are you wasting any fabric, Ricky? I go, um, you know, I have to kind of hang my head and go, yeah, I'm sure I have a lot of cheesecloth fabric and stuff that's not going to be functional. But on this quilt, I wanted to maximize the fabric. So with a jelly roll strip being two and a half inches wide by perhaps 42 inches uh, in across in the width, that would allow me to get four units. 
And my initial thought was I would take that unit and divide it diagonally. But I also have experience with as a quilter enough to know that if you have those sharp points that you see where the X is coming through, if you've got those, it is not that easy or friendly to put together. And then you're trying to match points, match points, and things have to be. So I simplified it. I decided to make these trapezoids. You can see that I've brought the slant in from the point and it made a much easier unit to make. But in the end, the way I did it, it's a one-shaped quilt because one of them's pointing down and one of them's pointing up, but it's, it's the same shape. It's just going in a different direction. And so the reason I want to talk about this on the front end is because I'm going to take you down a journey and you're going to need to really think about how you want to put your quilt together because I'm not pointing you to make my quilt. I'm not pointing you in that direction. It's there for you. You are 100% welcome to go this way, but I want to show you that some there are some options. On this particular version, you're noticing that every lady finger is pointing the same direction and it's cut exactly the same way every time. Every cut, I'm going to say, is leaning to the right. Okay, there's no leaning to the left. So on this one, it's been organized by color. And when we did these as a graphic art piece, it didn't have to stay in these rows of color, but of course it gets insane if we try to do too much. But I'm mostly showing you, here is a setting where all of those have been cut the same way. And you could have colored this with horizontal bands of color, vertical bands of color. You could have done this in just about any way that you want to. And then, if you're using certain colors, you can organize them. The, the one, the uh, setting number two, is essentially the same as you saw before, only everything is being shifted over. The colors are being managed in a little different way. Then on setting number three, we have both right-leaning and left-leaning ladyfinger units. And by putting them together in this kind of organized fashion, you can see that there is much more organization and there's this kind of pattern that's almost like an op art that's happening. Again, these are organized in very specific colors, but you could use this layout and make it in random colors. All right, so there's a possibility. <coughs> I'm not even going to be able to exhaust all of the possibilities. The reason this is important now is because when I teach you in a few minutes how to cut and sew your fabrics together, you need to have in your mind some kind of a plan or a roadmap on what colors you want to go together. So in this one, we've got where the, you can just you know, analyze it. You can see that there's right-leaning and left-leaning uh, ladyfinger uh, units, and you can see how they're coming together. And then uh, setting number five is put together horizontally instead of vertically in vertical rows, kind of like a Chinese coins quilt, only with tilted lines coming down. So there's a lot of options for you in doing your variations. Now, the main block that we are going to be doing is going to be cut two inches by 10 inches, which means it will finish one and a half by nine and a half. But should you like this variation, which has blocks, this means you can rot that, rotate them, you will have to trim yours down to two inches by nine and a half inches. And I mention that because this layout is putting six of the units together to make an actual square. And if you put six of the units that I'm going to teach you together, it will be one half inch off square. So uh, in your pattern, this is listed, and it's something that you would only need to do if you're looking for going into this kind of a style. And obviously, because this is my first rodeo with this quilt, I've not seen any variations other than the ones I've done 
we have just played with them digitally to see what kind of options might be available to everybody. So you can do all of the lady fingers horizontal, all of the lady fingers vertical, or if you want to do them in a mix and match of horizontal and vertical, you need to put them into blocks. Those blocks need to finish at nine inches, which means we're going to cut those units two inches by nine and a half. I've said enough about that. So we're going to be making ladyfinger units, and it is important for you to know that there's ones that are right angled, they lean to the right, and ones that are left angled, they lean to the left. This illustration is from your pattern. Again, I'm going to go through this with you. I mentioned this because in my quilt, I took no concern on what's left and what's right. I just had some left and some right, and I just let them randomly happen in my quilt, but I didn't want them all leaning right or all leaning left. There was also an advantage with my hand-dyed fabric in that I didn't have a right or wrong side to my fabric. So I could take any block that's leaning right and immediately pick those fabrics up, turn them over, and sew them together, and it would lean left. So that was an advantage. The batik kits... That would also be an advantage. Most of the ombres, though, you'll have to pay attention to what's right side and what's wrong side and be sure that you're cutting some of them that are leaning to the right and some of them that are leaning to the left. About 50% is what I do as we're going through there. All right, so on this, I'm just going to say, if you're, if you're not using a jelly roll, press your fabric. Um, this is selvage to selvage. And then take that selvage over, uh, the fold over to the line, and notice that usually it's not perfectly straight. So you've got to make a fresh cut on the first. I make sure I'm parallel across the bottom, and I am making my own strips in this particular case, because not all of you will be working with jelly rolls. So if you are working with a jelly roll, you get to avoid uh, and ignore this strip for a moment, but I'm going over two and a half inches. Yes, I did use the lines on my mat. I know for some people that's a big no-no. It is not a big no-no for me. So I would go over two and a half inches again, and I would just cut a few strips from this fabric, and then I would go to another fabric, and I would make strips from that, making a fresh cut first, and then doing my two and a half inch strips. So you've got a lot of flexibility to use scraps in your quilt. Textured fabrics, some of you love K uh, fa faucet fabrics, just really, really fun stuff. So I've just cut a few strips because I want to show you how things need to go together. And so those are the fabrics that I'm using for the sake of this example for you. Now, you can, you can stack these strips. I haven't opened them up. They're still folded on one end. The selvage is on the right side. I'm making sure that they're perfectly done, but at 10 and a half inches is where I'm going to cut, and then 10 and a half inches is where I will cut again. I'm going to just barely shave off that fold and then make sure, so I've cut two layers here. That's four layers total because it's two fabrics. I cut right on the line. I measured over 10 and a half inches, made the cut. Let's go 10 and a half more. I've already got a half, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, because I already had the half and cut on that line. And you can see out of one jelly roll strip, all that is left is that little bit at the end. And now I've yielded in this case four. So there's two of the floral, two of the purple, and then there's two of the floral, two of the purple. So I ended up with eight pieces and those measure two and a half by ten and a half okay that's step one now i also want to say when i'm working on a project i tend to do um assembly line which means i'm going to well or or step by step i'm going to do all of this step i'm just going to sit here and cut two and a half by ten inch ten and a half inch uh, units. I'm going to cut them, cut them, cut them, cut them, cut them. Then after I've got those cut, I'm going to go to the next step. I don't usually cut my two and a half by ten and a half and then go to the next step and then go to the next step and then rewind and go back to some more fabric. I like to do everything at once and then everything second, everything third, and that's how I particularly manage. 
So in this case, I've got eight fabrics. Now that's a lot of fabrics to stack. I did stack eight fabrics. Many of you may not have feel that you have the strength or even the re reasonable uh, control to do eight. So do four, okay? Because that would be much more manageable. And what that is, is stacking them on top of each other. So I'm stacking the eight on top of each other because I have some of my floral fabric right side up and some of it uh, right side down because of the way it's folded. I'm going to get both right and left leaning units in that. I'm going to come back just a little bit because we're going to measure over three quarters of an inch and at the bottom, sorry, I'm mean, one more time, I'm going to come back because I want you to see this. This is critical. Three-fourths of an inch at the bottom, three-fourths of an inch at the left. This is going to be a left-leaning cut. And I put the ruler on so that it is at three-quarters of an inch from the left at the top, right there, and three-quarters of an inch from the right at the bottom. So there's a left-leaning cut. But because I have right and wrong sides on that print, I am going to have some of both when I cut that. All right, so there they are. Now, the next really critical thing to know about these, you're just going to do this, has to happen when you're putting your pairs together to make the ladyfinger unit. The unit is two pieces. In this case, I want you to pay attention to the right angle. There's a right angle. Let's get there get them in line. There's a right angle right here, and the other one is not a right. There's a right angle right there. So I know that that is in position. One is now a left leaning, one is a right leaning. It is really easy to tilt that, and suddenly you do not have a right angle, and you can still sew them together, but it's not sewing them together correctly. Now, yes, I did that a few times myself, and you will likely do the same. But in order to make your pairs, that becomes important. So I work on my mat so that I can see the right angles. So in this case, I'm going to sew or I'm going to position the right angle of the purple one. And because it's a plain fabric, it didn't matter right or wrong side, but that's where it needed to go for that. Now, uh oh, I didn't need to do that. Let's go backwards. Where? Oh, I know what I know what I know exactly what that was. Yes, ex sorry, my bad. So this is this is the caution. The one on the right is what I'm trying to show you. You need to do, but there are two ways to do it wrong, and that's by getting one of them in the wrong orientation. And you can see that they're not quite right. Okay, so you're going to be. That's just a little word of caution that you're working on that right angle as you go through there. All right, so these are the two I'm going to do. They're both kind of dark. Um, I didn't do very many that were light and dark. But now you can see I've positioned them so that I can see the right angle of the purple, the right angle of the print, put them right sides together. And when you do this, you need to have a little bit of a peak, in this case of the purple, showing right at the quarter inch mark where we're going to sew that seam. I find using a little starter is a really helpful way to not have any of this fabric go diving down into your sewing machine. So I encourage that. Now use a scant quarter inch. I, I can't stress enough. I would rather for this to be scant than it end up not being the wrong size because we are going to trim them. So once that's been sewn, take it over to the iron. You're going to press these seams one way or another. I mean, press to the dark side is what we always say, but it doesn't really matter. Just press one way or the other. So I've done a uh, set my seam. Now I'm going to open that up and press that so that there's no pleats at all on that unit. Now, the reason I said a little bit of a scant quarter of inch, and even if it's a little less than normal, is because of the next step. I really want these units to be cut exactly two inches by 10 inches. 
So if they're a little bit big, if they're two and a sixteenth, I can get rid of that sixteenth. But if you take too big of a seam allowance and you don't have a full two inches, now you're starting to have some problems in getting your quilt together. So the last step, once I've done a bunch of these, right? So on the chain piecing is what I would do. Just chain piece them all down the way. We're going to trim them to two by 10. Now I put the purple one on the edge. I trimmed a little bit off of the print. And you can just look at this. It was almost nothing, but that's going to make my quilt more accurate by getting rid of that. And now I have, I have something in the range of 10 and a half, but I'm, going to, I'm now going to trim off both ends so they're perfectly square and it's 10 inches by 2 inches or 2 inches by 10 inches. And that is what we're going to do for this first lesson. We're going to make a stockpile of these. You get to decide how wide your quilt, how tall your quilt. Uh, the jelly rolls on the kit will allow you to make a quilt at least the size of mine. And you'll have a little bit left over, but not a lot. Um, but if you wanted it to be bigger, you just make more units on a row and you make more rows so that it's a taller quilt. So I'm going to escape from there, come back to here. Hey guys missed you and just look a little bit at if there's any questions i see a lot of hellos and i feel like you guys are enjoying the show congratulating me on Hugo's green card i get to see where a lot of you are yep and the trees are doing great you're right about that Oh, Linda, I'm so happy. It's going to be a beautiful quilt. I'll talk a little bit about it. So there is in the comments on uh, YouTube, those of you that are watching on YouTube, and I'm sure also in, in Facebook, if you pop down into the comments, you're going to see the link for the printed pattern or the PDF. And also you can find the, um, the kits there. Um, I need to sort out a wind bear to protect my vegetation and trellis system. You could train beans to go up, cover the trellis. I am. Julie, thank you for that. That's a little uh, gardening tip. We are figuring it out. Uh, just tell you that it's a journey, and I love the journey. Do I recommend using starch since they're long and skinny? Um, if that works for you, I would say please do it. I would be truthful to tell you I did not use any starch on making this quilt. But if it works for you, 100%. Um, they are skinny blocks. But as you saw, I was using just, just a tad smaller seam allowance than we normally do so that when they open, they're just a little bit wider and I'm going to make them perfect. I might be more inclined to use a starch or a best press or something when they're pressed for the first time so that they're bigger. And then when I square them up, they're a little bit more sturdy. That certainly is not a bad idea. Nancy Hines, I have no doubt that you have some of my hand dyes. It is a very straightforward technique. Um, just, Hugo is my husband, Don, from Portugal. I'm sorry you haven't met him online. He is beloved by so many people. He's like a master chef, although he doesn't do it professionally. And he's learning to quilt and on YouTube... You can find Hugo makes a quilt and you will roll because when I met Hugo, he didn't even know the word quilt. So to see him start by learning about what a needle is and what a throat plate is and what a quarter inch seam is, it's pretty exciting. Starch will shrink the jelly rolls. Well, I'm okay with them shrinking as long as I cut them to two inches by 10 inches. That's the key. And that's, I'm giving you some fudge factors. That's why we're starting with 10 and a half inches. That's the original cut, right? By the two and a half. Sew them together with a little bit smaller seam allowance. And then whenever you open that up, it's both taller and a smidge wider. And I know it's extra effort to go in and do all that trimming, but we all got things to binge on TV. So just, you know, get in your sewing room and watch the quilt show. How about that for a while? Um, let's see if there's any other big questions here. 
Don't be nervous, Bess. I'm so excited for you. Don't be nervous. The thing that I want to I want to go back to is that I want you to spend a little bit of time thinking about what you want your quilt to look like. Now, I want you to look at mine a little bit. On this quilt, I obviously knew I wanted the yellows coming down in the middle here. Okay, let me point there, right there. I can't do it very well. I can do that like that. And I would do yellows and oranges. So when I was making my pears, I created a whole lot of yellow and orange and then moved to a more orangey red. And even with that, you'll notice that I put in some kind of dusty blues and greens. They're not all perfectly the same, but the values tended to move out. But look, how did that yellow one get there? That yellow one got there because I went, you know, every now and then, I think it might be reasonable to have a pop of color out in the darkness. So look at the one in that bottom down there, right? That means at some point, I made a decision to say, I don't want it to go perfectly just dark all the way across the bottom. I'm okay having these extra cracks of light elsewhere. And if you wanted to organize yours by, I want to go from purple to green to or yellow green to yellow and moving to orange, you may want to create a rainbow that's just dripping in your quilt. Then you will just start thinking about what do I need to pair together? I want to mention this because it's been in my head and I hope I can say it in words. When we think about a log cabin quilt, and I hope that most of you would know what that is, the log cabin block is one block that's made with the logs, but it has a half dark and a half light area, right? That's what creates the magic of a log cabin is by having the, diag these, the logs on the bottom left looking light, for example, and the ones on the upper right are dark. But did you know that you can create that same kind of effect if you used all light fabrics like you would normally do for the light triangle side, but the opposite side, if you went dark, light, dark, light, dark, so it was kind of striped, stri striped word, striped, so it was kind of striped, those, even though they're intermingled, will still give the same effect. So you could have a dark area that has light intermingled with it. I just think, and that's a, maybe a good thing to look online, I just, it's something that came to my head this morning when I was not sleeping because I was excited about this class. Just got the pattern, Richard. That's awesome. It. Uh, I, I thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. So I'll also tell you, I didn't necessarily know where I was going with this when I started it. That's why a design wall is so important. I, I knew. I knew this. I wanted to make an, a fairly easy quilt that would be very accessible to quilters everywhere. I wanted to use jelly rolls because quilters love them, or we could just cut our own strips, but they're just, it's the same thing over and over. You're not going to have to cut a two inch by three inch this and a half square triangle that's four and a half by this. It's just one thing over and over to make it life easy. And then once I decided on that shape, I just needed to start playing with fabric. And whenever I, got this closer to the end, I felt that I had created this kind of window to another world, a passageway, a portal. And so it is, uh, very, for me, this is a very spiritual quilt. For, for me personally, it's not meant to be that for everybody else. But I know that life is a journey. And in my own belief system, I believe that there is something beyond and we don't get to see that clearly but it's inviting and it's friendly and not horribly frightening so um so this is what that meant to me i don't necessarily mean for you to make what i meant 
But if that speaks to you, then 100% I would want you to do that. I piece with just a regular, first of all, I piece with cotton thread because heat will, if it's really hot, it will melt polyester thread. So I piece with uh, cotton thread. I prefer like a 50 weight, the Alex Anderson masterpiece, something in that genre so that it is fine, fine thread. You don't want a big rope that you're stitching with because then the wraparound that has to go over that thread re reduces your accuracy. So use cotton thread. Medium color is good because I'm using so many colors. I generally press to the dark side, Kimberly, but as I mentioned, I'm not paying... I mean, yes, generally, but I, it's not that big of a deal. I it's the biggest deal on those yellow ones in the center. That's where the biggest deal is, uh, where I don't want to see any shadowing. But overall, I'm not using flimsy, fine, see-through fabrics. So um, if you do see shadowing, then push that seam to the other side. Always a good idea. Frank, I, I honestly think, Frank, the, the two kits, Frank was saying I purchased a kit uh, pattern with the, the jelly rolls. Uh, the batik ones, and he thinks it's going to look beautiful. I, I have only got to see photos of those jelly rolls. I have not got to lay my hands on them because they're in California and I'm in Colorado. But I think that from what Kristen and I worked on when she ordered those, I think they're they're gorgeous. All right, um, ninety weight thread. I would not use a ninety weight. Uh, it just seems a little bit too fine for me, but I would probably use a 50 weight. Thank you, Mary. Uh, she said she likes what the quilt means. How would you range a floral jelly roll? I, 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 I mean, it's hard to answer that because I can't see the fabric, but I trust your instinct. If you're finding fabrics that you like and you love the texture of that floral, then just keep finding florals and then maybe find darker florals and just use that beautiful texture to make your quilt be unique to you. I am totally, totally sold. And yes, Mary has reminded about the acorn spray. Super, really good for, for seams. That is true, most definitely. All right, I, I don't want to leave you, but I don't necessarily need to stay and just visit. You've got this, and for those of you that may have, you know, you missed the front of it or don't know what's going on, this will be posted on Facebook in, immediately as well as on YouTube. You can find it at uh, my pages, and you can find it on the Quilt Show pages, and I am really looking forward to seeing what you do. I won't see that till the final showcase on the final day, but I'm looking forward to seeing what we uh, do together and um, just come back on Friday if you've got questions, uh, if you found any hiccups, or if you found anything that you might like to share that was helpful to you that other people might benefit from. Be sure to come back on Friday and share those things as well. All right, you guys, I am going to say, <laughs> I'm going to say goodbye. You're awesome. I love all of you for being in my world, um, and I hope you have just such a fabulous week. And be excited about what you're doing. Get out there and garden or do whatever else you do too. But find time to make those quilts. Be passionate about what you do. Be creative. And it's always worthwhile. All right, everybody. I'm going to say goodbye. Bye.